So thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, bright and early. I'm thrilled to be able to share a little bit about our work and our approach. Um, when Tina came to me with the theme shock, uh, obviously, there's a bunch of our work that deals with shock and things that are shocking. Um, but I, I wanted to sort of flip that idea on its head because it's, it's, in some ways, a little bit obvious to talk about, for example, 9-11. And I'll talk a little bit about the museum. But um, the thing that, that occurred to me uh, is something that's called a flashbulb memory. Because uh, what actually, I was thinking about how shock actually works on the brain. And with something like 9-11, you have a good example of that. So I was doing a panel, and I met a researcher who researches what are called flashbulb memories. And those are these huge, significant events like the explosion of the space shuttle or the uh, assassination of JFK or, indeed, 9-11. And what's interesting is the way that these memories are actually inscribed onto our brain and the ways in which they impact us. So raise your hand if you actually remember 9-11 and remember exactly where you were. OK. So this is really typical. And he basically did this amazing study where six weeks after 9-11, he went around and interviewed a huge swath of people. And then he returned a year later, and then three years later. And what he discovered was actually that the memories themselves shifted really radically for a large proportion of people. So if you're in the six row, first six rows, can you just raise your hand? Keep going. All six. Yeah. So that's one third of the audience. That's the number of people whose memories shifted radically. And by radically, I mean it shifted from, oh, my roommate told me, to, oh, I heard it on the television, to, I was standing in my bedroom, to, no, I was downtown. Right? Like radical changes. And this is, I think, a good example of the way that the world works on us. And it changes us. It shifts us. It shifts these things that are really important to us, that, that burn brightly in our brain and in our memory. I want to talk about a different type of flashbulb, one that's actually both connected to 9-11, but has uh, something positive to it. This is 34th Street, uh, Herald Square. And I was literally standing exactly here during the competition to actually win the 9-11 Memorial Museum when I had essentially the, the sort of single flashbulb moment, and I'll never forget it, that actually turned its way into the actual pitch that ended up winning the project that I then worked on for eight years. Now, to put a little context on it, our studio was tiny when we got this opportunity. Uh, it was kind of unfathomable, but that was even uh, an opportunity for us. We were three people. We'd partnered with Think Design because we had done this project, StoryCorps, uh, as the interaction designers. And so to put a little context on this, this was a project with Dave Isay, where people were interviewing each other in these soundproof booths. And one copy was going into the Library of Congress, and then one copy uh, goes onto the radio, or it goes with you, and then excerpts go into the radio. And so I just thought I'd share a little bit of the audio because one thing that we learned during StoryCorps was the way in which uh, people, when they're sharing memories, when they're having conversations, essentially when they're expressing something that's really important to them, oftentimes as you, you grapple for these big words that aren't necessarily on the tip of your tongue, you actually reach past a sort of everyday colloquial language and somehow your words transform into poetry. And so I thought I might just share this clip, and then I'll, I'll talk about how we started thinking about that. See, the thing of it is, I always feel guilty when I say I love you to you, and I say it so often. I say it to remind you that as dumpy as I am, it's coming from me. It's, it's like hearing a beautiful song from a busted old radio, yeah, well, and it's nice of you to keep the radio around the house. Right? It's so beautiful, this idea that this busted old radio in the house. And so while I was thinking about 9-11, there were all of these sort of ideas that were, or, or, or constraints that were flashing through my head. And I'm sure we've all had these creative moments where all you can see are the roadblocks. You know it's a big opportunity. You know there's something there to be expressed. But, you know, people said it's too soon to make the museum. We don't know what 9-11 is about. Or what's taking so long? Why aren't you able to just jam in a story and share it with everybody? Or that people would come into the museum and having run out of the burning buildings, they'd feel such, such a sense of ownership they would reject any curator or historian telling that story. Or the fact that the story isn't over. It's somewhere between history and current events. And with literally just three weeks, that's the way the competition worked. We had three weeks and a huge host of artifacts to put together an exhibition design, present it back to the museum. 
We had no time to waste. And so I was standing on that platform, and suddenly I started thinking about StoryCorps, about this idea of the poetry that comes out of our ed everyday expressions, and also thinking about the fact that if you were able to make a museum that actually wasn't finished when it opened, but that was there to actually interview the people as they walked through about their own experiences, you'd suddenly have all of these conditions met at the same time. And that was the idea that then turned into this. This was the fly-through that we made to actually win the project. So there's a bunch of ideas in here, including this. This is a, a piece of steel that actually hangs in the museum in that spot. But this idea that I became a sort of champion of during the pitch process uh, really got summed up in this. This is a, a timeline of events. And they gave us these uh, words and times, but we overlaid it with these pieces of blue text. And the blue text was meant to essentially be memories of exactly those moments, to, to highlight for people in the museum that there are facts, 1003, this thing happened, that's an absolute fact. We have taped uh, evidence of that. But this, this memory, like a waterfall, thousands of panes of glass shattering, like that is this poetic expression. It suddenly made me think we could bring something beautiful, something human, something frail to this museum. And on top of different artifacts, we could we could project directly onto it people's memories of those artifacts. In fact, at that point, we thought, well, maybe we could even gather the memories inside of the museum. You could go to that museum and feel like you would find a place inside of this institution because you could share your own experiences. And sure enough, we ended up winning the project. Uh, we did the master plan. Uh, we ended up designing all the exhibitions with Think Design. Then we designed all the media. Then we developed it full eight years of my life. And during that time, an enormous amount of work happened, an enormous amount of energy was generated. But some of those original impulses, even down to this, this is the original slurry wall that withheld the, the strength of the Hudson River for a full year afterwards, came to pass so that when we actually opened, it was incredible to hear President Obama at the uh, dedication say, here we will tell the story of generations yet unborn we'll never forget of coworkers who led others to safeties, passengers who stormed a cockpit, our men and women in uniform who rushed into an inferno. And so it was, it was like literally hearing that original kernel of an idea come forward and be actually shared with the world in a way that we actually hadn't anticipated. So this is one of the original uh, designs that we had for that first entryway that goes into the museum. And we wanted it to be this hall of different memories. And you can see, sure enough, the text is blue. And so we were trying to hold fast to this idea. But of course, you have a great idea, but your client's like, well, how do I know this will work? Has this ever been done before? And we're like, no, that's the beauty. This is a new idea. They said, well, we're not going to take a chance with this type of an institution with a crazy idea that's never been done before. Like, how are we supposed to move forward? And there was a lot of back and forth over not just days or weeks or months, but literally years of grinding uh, inertia for the project because it was impossible to move forward and convince people that this new thing could be a success. And so finally, we actually flipped it and said, you know what? We're going to stop trying to convince you. You've hired us for our expertise, but it's very clear that we just can't sort of outthink you and promise you it'll be good. So we're just going to make it. And that's what we started doing. We started prototyping our way through the process, and that was the key to actually jumping past the sort of back and forth loggerheads of people arguing about the ideas that were in their head. And we just said, we're going to make this. And if it fails, then you know it's really bad and you don't like it. And that's OK, because we'll move on to the next idea. But this is the first piece that we made. This is a third, one third model. So people walk through it. And this is the first thing that proved to them that, yes, we could align the panels in a way that it would look like a world map. Uh, we also ended up leaving this up for six weeks. They brought through uh, first the curators and the head of the foundation, head of the museum, then the board then different stakeholders, then family members, all the concentric rings of people who had a say in the project. And then we eventually prototyped it again full scale. This is at a fabricator in Buffalo. You can hear a little bit of the audio. And then in the final museum, this is actually what it looked like. So literally eight years after that first initial idea, this is what we had. On September 11th. September 11th. I was in Honolulu, Hawaii. Cairo, Egypt. In college at UC Berkeley. I was in Times Square. In São Paulo, do Brasil. I was in Miami, Florida. In Scottish Highland. In... We were actually in a meeting when someone barged in and said, Oh my God, that plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center. Trying to frantically get to a radio. When I heard it over the radio. And so having made your way through this chamber where you hear and experience this idea that a third of the world watched this event live. You then see these witness photographs, people who are seeing it with their own eyes, and then 
Just past there is that slurry wall where you get to witness it yourself. And this idea of people's own personal stories became expressed in so many different ways inside of the museum. We held on to it all the way through the end and we found all these different places uh, where you could just project little moments of people's experiences inside of all these different parts of the exhibition. And what was amazing was, uh, you know, there's a lot of things inside of this museum, but we were able to, to basically weave this approach throughout the entire piece all the way through uh, to the end where you can actually leave your own memory. I'll show that in a sec. Now, obviously, the, the museum's huge. There's actually a lot in it. There's a memorial exhibition that talks about the lives that were lost. This is an exhibition that shows an algorithm that sifts through over 3 million news articles and creates custom timelines for each new day about the impact of 9-11 on our world. But this exhibit I wanted to share, this is the last thing inside the museum. So again, this idea that the museum is a listening institution, that it's there to gather your own story. We started with that idea, but what's amazing is, uh, you know, 12 or 13 years after the event now, people are still working through their feelings and their thoughts on the event. And so this place where you can add your own memory has now become a place for people to really synthesize their thoughts about 9-11 itself. And once we were able to prototype ideas like this for the museum, they were able to see that making the museum a platform, like I just shot these with my phone uh, about a year ago. These are just random messages that people were able to put up. Suddenly the, the museum has so much more energy and emphasis because people are adding in their own messages. And this then elevates the entire experience because it has that level of authenticity. Because you know, because you just went and signed it, that all of these were just signed by different people sifting through the museum. And that's part of what I think brings the museum its power. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about was this idea about ideas and where they actually come from. This is a, you know, almost a stock phrase at this point. Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, right? The idea that you sort of work your way through it. But, but the second part of this quote that I had never seen before until I looked for it, I actually like a lot more. Accordingly, a genius is often merely a talented person who has done all of his or her homework. Right? It's so great. First of all, it's, it's like over 100 years ago, so he added his or her, so I appreciate that. But beyond that, this idea that, right, like, that, that genius is just sort of being prepared, right, like having your homework done. And that, to a certain extent, is what we were doing when we were thinking about all these problems with 9-11 and how we could actually energize it and turn it on its head. We have a lot of different ideas that we put together at local projects. This is the work that we did for Cleveland Museum of Art. The idea here was putting all 4,000 artworks up at the same time and allowing people to both see the connections between them and add them onto an iPad or an iPhone or Android to create your own tour of the museum. It's essentially using the museum again like a platform. This is one of the craziest ideas we've had. This is using facial detection to connect you with a, a work of art. Right, so as you make these crazy faces, suddenly it shows you this beautiful artwork that you should go visit. It sort of transforms the entire gallery into this performative experience, a social place. Suddenly a, a museum is a place to, to gather a crowd. Um, this is at the top of the World Trade Center. We had this idea that if you were at the, the top is, highest point in all of North America, you'd want to look out onto the city and use live data through a storyteller to actually tell you stories about what's happening in New York City right at that moment. So this is a complete gesture-based system, and they can basically grab anything from these different live feeds and share them. Or this we actually did with Bjarke Ingels. This is an idea about love. This was made for Valentine's Day, a commission through the Times Square Alliance, where you can touch this sensor, and this light sculpture will actually beat in resonance with your heart. So you're sort of sitting in the center of Times Square, seeing yourself project at large. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, in this talk about just the sort of anatomy of making an idea, and then how you actually bring it all the way to fruition. Because I think that's the big gift for all creative people, is, is both the capacity to make this idea, and then to steward it, to guard it, and to launch it into the world. So I'm just going to show a couple of case studies. The first one being this. This is a project that we did for Target about the Internet of Things. Can I see an honest raise of hands? How many people don't know really what the Internet of Things is? OK, so you're a rarefied crowd. Typically, you get most people admitting like, yeah, I, kind of, I mean, I, I don't know. It's like a big deal. People tell me it's a big deal. It's going to help me someday. I don't like I, I've seen the, they, the thermostat thing. I don't know, right? I mean, that, that's the challenge, is that the Internet of Things, I think, has a storytelling problem. 
right? Like nobody really knows what it's about, except for ostensibly the people who are saying it's a trillion dollar market that, is, that we're all you know, galloping towards. Target themselves hired us to think about essentially a lab or a store in San Francisco that would help them connect with Internet of Things customers as well as makers uh, in the Bay Area. And so we came to them with ideas like this. We were working with Todd Waterbury, the chief creative officer there. And uh, we had a very high stress two day workshop. First day we showed him three big ideas. We worked through everything. And at the end he was like, you know what? I have to say, uh, like this is beautiful, this is great, but this could be Google, this could be Microsoft. This, this actually doesn't feel very much like Target. And he said, you know, this is the closest because it has an actual home in it. Target, he said, is both really cool, it's cutting edge, it's interesting, it's fresh, uh, but it's also really warm, it's familiar. It's your house, it's your family, it's your life. And so overnight we went back and thought, well, maybe we could actually take the home itself and make that the subject of the engagement. And so we presented this the next day, which ended up being the sort of winner. The idea being that we were gonna make a giant translucent house filled with all these products, and then the products were just gonna to talk to you about what the Internet of Things are. So they're just gonna to explain to you how it works. And so we said, well, maybe we can actually make the walls projection spaces and show literally these data trails between the different objects. Because that's the big idea of Internet of Things, is that basically you get these connected objects that can pay attention to each other, and then things can respond intelligently. And very, very fast we made this idea. You can see this was our projection test. You can see in the background people are making those motion graphics as we speak. We did full-scale projection tests. And this is a lot of the ways that we work. We have this core impulse like, oh, we're going to make a translucent house. Oh, we're going to make these things talk to each other. And then we just prototype it. And we constantly make things in full scale. And we learn from the prototypes. So we're constantly making and then stepping back and saying, well, does that work? Is this interesting? Is this fun? Do we like this? Would you do this? Uh, and then we're also inviting our clients to do the same thing. We have a very open door policy. We don't think that we're necessarily the experts. We're the experts on making. But because we make things for audiences, inevitably the audience, and oftentimes that's the client. And in fact, that's the part of the client that might be hostile or might not know anything about technology. We like those people in particular, right? Because they're the toughest critics and they also know the least about what we're doing. Now the project itself was super fast. Uh, this was the space in February. By May we had done this and by June we were actually open. Uh, so the entire thing from the first phone call to opening was six months. I don't actually recommend those timelines. <laughs> <laughs> but we were able in that short amount of time to produce this. This is the final uh, engagement. Uh, and it's up now. It's, it's right up to the Moscone Center in downtown San Francisco. And the idea, again, came through that you have all of these little products. Uh, and you have little scenarios and stories that can share with you exactly how the products themselves work. Uh, and this is everything from individual light bulbs uh, to Sonos sound systems that can talk about how they work to you. And then, again, showing the connections between the objects, showing how the products actually talk to each other in very simple little scenarios. So, yep, it's nighttime. They're just going to turn themselves off for you. Or small spaces as you walk through, much like IoT, the, the room is actually aware of where you are, and then things can just talk to you. Yes, that's right. So it's an exciting way to basically take this very, very complex thing and turn it into a simple story that you just experience and walk through. So the next step, once you've had that idea, uh, is holding on to the idea. I had a, a mentor back when I did set design, and he said, you know, you have to hold on tightly and then let go lightly. Meaning you have this idea, you need to protect it, but you need to really think about exactly what that idea is as you move through the design process. Who knows what this is? Anyone want to yell out what they think this is? Any guess? Oh, I think I heard it out there. So not sound recorded. It's actually, it is a microscope. This is the first microscope ever. And this was our inspiration for a project that we did with the Gates Foundation and the New York Hall of Science, where we thought, you know, it's funny, you have uh, these miraculous inventions for humankind, like the microscope, that extended our capacity to see in ways that were really material and that advanced things so radically. And we started thinking, well, people have these experiences in their own life. This is uh, essentially a playground set. And if you think about play, and particularly playgrounds, they're almost like machines for physics that get put onto your own body. Right? We thought, well, if you could only make an instrument that could extract that learning, those things, uh, those ways in which you know that a swing actually involves uh, these specific forces in these theorems, if you could just extract that from your own experience, it'd be so much more real. And so we thought, well, let's make that. Right? And that's what we pitched to the Gates Foundation. We used this sensor kit, and we applied it to these slides 
Uh, we made these different mats that have different coefficients of frictions. There was a lot of work. We made this iPad app that basically worked with the different slide uh, materials themselves, and it showed the ways in which you would go up and down. And so we were midway through prototype, we were really excited. You know, we're, I mean, we're essentially a client services agency, right? So we're like burning through all the, all the resources that we had to make this happen. And then something kind of drastically horrible happened, which is that as it happens in prototyping, it actually wasn't working that well, right? Like it was good, we were getting good sensor data, like we made a good video. Like we could have shown this Gates Foundation and been like, all right, here's your video. <laughs> Sorry that the actual thing doesn't work that well. Right, but that's not the end goal of what we're looking for. We again had this core idea about lifting people's experiences out of their everyday life and whether or not the sensors are janky or more importantly, even if you perfected the sensors, it's really limited in what it can do, right? It's kind of the opposite of play because you're stuck on this mat going down the same slide over and over again. And so we had an internal meeting, we met with the clients, uh, we rejiggered our approach um, we ate, yes, a bunch of costs, and we ended up saying, you know what, we're going to change our approach, and we're going to use video, actually. Let's test that out. And you can see these are early videos. You can see we're still using the sensors on the bottom here. This was actually the prototyping session that convinced us, you know what, it's more important to have an open system than it is to have sensors and their specific data. And so what we ended up doing was a system that allowed people to do something like this, which is actually to mess with it, right? Because it's an open platform. It essentially uses video and then you trace the video. And by tracing the video, it can show you all the different aspects of kinetic and potential energy, inertia, mass, and momentum inside of any movement. So it's a complete system for play and for performance. Just is gonna play you two clips uh, from some of the documentation we've done since its launch. It's just uh, launched in the App Store uh, this September. But it's kind of amazing to hear the kids themselves, just like with an open mic, talk back to you about exactly what that concept was. The iPlay app is an app that allows you to see the physics in your everyday life. Like when you're running, jumping, or doing any activities, you can take a video and it can show what your physics in your everyday life is. So yeah, this idea that you can show what the physics in your everyday life is uh, ended up being the real hallmark of the entire platform. So you can see basically you just have two kids, so it's social uh, between the two kids themselves and you're able to basically watch a kid do something and perform, and then the physics itself comes out of it. But for me, the most gratifying thing is the kid's own realization about exactly how that openness of the platform makes the learning so much more tangible to them. I understand it better when it's in the app. From the book, they don't really show it. I mean, like they just tell you it, but they don't really show it. From the app, you can do it by yourself. So this idea that the book just tells you they don't really show it, they just tell you, right? But that you can go and do anything and then reveal the physics, reveal that potential and kinetic energy inside of it. I mean, that again, all the way back to that original idea was the core concept. And again, when you hit that roadblock, sometimes it is right, you need to cut back, you need to go back to that original idea and manifest it in a remarkably different way. And so then the last one I'm gonna show you uh, is from the Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian Design Museum. Uh, and it's the idea of letting go. Uh, and so over these long processes, you have all these backs and forths and challenges. I mean, literally, uh, like I was saying on 9-11, there were years where we were holding on to ideas and then we brought them back to the table and they found a place. Uh, and on the Cooper Hewitt, we had sort of an uphill battle from the beginning because we were dealing with a, an institution that's both very forward-looking, has amazing people, but that also is by its nature conservative, right? That's what curators do, they conserve things. Uh, and it's in the old Carnegie Mansion uh, on the Upper East Side, and we said to them, well, we want to expand the audience for the Cooper Hewitt by looking at families and looking at people who like design but don't know a lot about it, because that wasn't really the group that were coming. And we want to do it by actively inviting everyone to participate. And so we said, what if we gave everyone a pen? This is actually the, the, literally the first shot from the pitch deck that we showed them. We said, you know, with this pen, you could basically collect inspirations. It would activate you inside of the gallery so you can gather any of those objects. Uh, you could make things, and then you could end up hearing stories. And I remember exactly where I had this idea. This was actually in partnership with Dillis Cafidio Renfro, and I was working with one of the architects there. He was talking about the fact that their architecture creates moments of generosity. And he was like, you know what I want? I want people, and you've, I'm sure, been in these sort of like brainstorm conversations where people are either you know, griping or complaining 
or exasperated about the different constraints. He was like, you know, it's a problem. It's like, go in these museums. They're so stuffy. And they don't acknowledge that. Like, you're there with your book and you want to be inspired. Like, you want a drink and a book. And I was like, you know what you want? You want a pen. And suddenly, like, that hit me because it was like, Right, the pen solves all of these constraints that I've been thinking about. We want to track people and gather things. We want people to make stuff. We want people to participate. And we want people to basically create a relationship with the museum that isn't passive, but that is active and that is making. And all those things happen at that moment. I said, we want a pen. He was like, yeah, a pen. I was like, no, 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 like a, like a pen, like a magic pen. <laughs> and we ended up with a magic pen. It was amazing. So GE, Sysdel Networks, Make Simply, Undercurrent, like a huge number of partners worked on this project. But with such a pen, we imagine you could do all of these different things. You could go up to any uh, individual table, draw a line, and then see part of the collection come forward with exactly that same shape inside of it. Right, so this is part of our thesis that essentially line work, everything starting with these lines, like it has a history unto itself. And it has an expression, and anybody can do this, right? Because everyone can draw a simple line. But that everything inside the museum, all those masterworks, started with an artist or a designer having this moment of inspiration, expressing it visually, and suddenly all these things come forward. And so we were excited to imagine all these different things that the pen could do. And we said, well, from the line work, what if you could actually make stuff? What if you could design stuff? This is our maybe third prototype of this approach. Uh, and the, and the, the brief was almost insurmountably hard. It, was, it has to work for superstar architects like Frank Gehry, but also has to work with a four-year-old. Right? And that's hard to solve that. And so we ended up making something that, you know, just a straight line work. You could basically manipulate it. You could change some of the materials in it. And then we had this idea, which was probably the farthest one that we went. We said, what if we projected in a live way, in a single room, all the patterns? The, the museum has this amazing international wallpaper collection. And so what if we filled up a room with this and allowed people to basically maybe even take those patterns with them? They actually haven't done this yet, but they're going to do it, they promised me. <laughs> and then sure enough, we had to prototype it. And there was a ton of skepticism. There was a lot of people who said, this won't work. It's not a good idea. Uh, it's not going to be interesting. And then they saw the prototype. They're like, well, this is, this is actually super interesting. We were able to work with the curator so that it had a lot of the content and stories, but built into the interface itself, right? So the ways that it repeats. This is all this Alexander Girard material. We wanted to feel like you're almost interning inside of his studio. When you're actually designing wallpapers similar to him, you can look at the things that he was inspired by and actually design in a similar fashion. Or you can just look at the different artworks themselves uh, and hear from working designers about them. And so what I think is uh, kind of cool in terms of the final engagement is the way that all of these pieces started to come together, right? And that's one thing that is really, uh, at the end of the day, sort of shocking, because we didn't know it was going to happen. But we have over 99% pickup rate on the pen. Uh, it's kind of amazing. The average, so this is the average number. And know that a lot of people just take the pen. They're like, whatever. They hold it. They don't lose it, and they put it in. The average number of objects collected is 35. It's like a huge number. The amount of time that people are spending in the museum is significantly longer. It's a pretty small museum, and people spend, on average, about uh, almost two hours there. And uh, one third of the visitors go back afterwards to actually look online at what they either created. So you can grab something and then see your collection. And they go back to actually establish a longer relationship with the museum, look at everything that they gather from the past. And that, to me, was so shocking, speaking of shocking. right? This this a uh, way in which you could make these different materials and be surprised about how people would end up using them. And so that's the last thing I really wanted to talk about was how you can be shocked when you actually put an idea out there, particularly when you're starting to making, make things that are interactive, and beyond that, things that are a platform for visitors' own expressions. Suddenly, it's really shocking because how people are using this is totally, totally unexpected. Right? And you can see, have people actually find themselves inside, for example, in the wallpaper room. It becomes this platform for people to express their own ideas and to have their own insights. And that's the amazing part, is the way in which it, again, becomes social and it becomes performative for people to find themselves inside of here. And the stuff that people make is so crazy. Right? The museum actually has these amazing challenges uh, that they put forward. They call it the immersion room. And so... I just grabbed this off Instagram. These are just shots of things that people have made inside of the museum, right? 
so there's been over 2 million articles totally that have been uh, saved by different visitors. Uh, but this is the part that I love, is the way in which people find themselves inside of those expressions. Because new ideas are now born here every single idea, day. And it makes me think about what I was talking about before, the, the idea that you have to make your idea. I mean, you have to do your homework. You have to, to actually fashion that idea. But then you have to hold on to it. Right? You actually have to grip onto your idea and make sure that as you're changing it and evolving it, you're also nurturing it and making sure that it'll come forward. You need to care for it. And you need to acknowledge the fact that the world is going to work on you, that it's going to make it hard for you to bring it forward. You need to listen and to improve. And you need to not give up when you have that idea. Because at the end of the day, once you have that idea and release it, it will go in the most amazing places you never expected. Thank you so much. Wow.